for so many years, the idea of red heifers was sort of a, in your mind or you know thinking about it. The nations come here, look at something that isn't an idea anymore. <laughs> it's a reality. I really feel there's something happening here in reality. Recently, we visited Israel, where we filmed with Dr. Scott Stripling at the ancient Shiloh Tell. The discoveries being made there are truly incredible. We also learned that the red heifers were located at this very site. A few years ago, we produced a series on rebuilding the Jewish temple, during which we discussed the significance of the red heifers. I even had the opportunity to visit them when they were just little calves in Dallas. And we had also done a Q&A session talking about the red heifers and answering questions. I had to stop in and see how they were doing now that they were three years old. I had no idea that my conversation with a wonderful man who was a volunteer keeping the red heifers clean and fed would lead to such an engaging discussion, not only about the current red heifers in Israel, but also about the ancient red heifer ashes and temple incense. You're going to find this fascinating. Hey guys, remember me? <gasps> he said yes. Yes, I don't remember which one. Were you at the church uh, in no. Dallas on Christmas? No. Nope. It was like Christmas Eve or something. When they first found them. Yeah. And then I interviewed the rancher and he told the story and, and all of that. So yeah. how do you come into the story? <laughs> uh, I never know quite where to start. The easy thing is uh, I was here on a planned dig back in November. I dig with, used to be Mendel Jones, you know, looking for the ashes of the red hair for the ancient ones. Uh -huh. And in 92, we found 1,500 pounds of spices in a cave that the Copper Scrolls describes. Wow. And it says beneath the spices, there's a purification. And I always, I have a sample of the spices if you're interested in oh. seeing that, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they all still pure enough or? No, okay. there's two definitely not. Okay. Oh, here they come. Hi, how are you? That's the one with the, with the bump? This is two dots. Two dots, oh yeah, I see the two dots. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I do know that Goldie here, see those little warts on the side? Hey, Goldie, yeah, okay, yeah, she's okay. She's not qualified. Either. Okay, so there's a few things already that's disqualified a couple, but yeah. you know, that's, it'll, it'll be some time to- So actually what they plan to do now is to breed these artificial insemination. Okay. So that in the future, there might be more. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Good. Yeah. So this could be the breeding females for an eventual qualification yeah. once they're ready. Okay. Yeah, you see the, the warts right there on the side of her. Hey, how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three of them still qualify. Two of them definitely. Third sort of had some problems that they're just sort of watching, but it wouldn't disqualify them if she got it. over it. Yeah, got it. You can sort of see sometimes they have watery eyes. Okay. And yeah, it's just something they're watching. So okay. So going back to your question, how did I get involved? I was involved in archaeological project down at Qumran using the copper scroll, and in '92 we found 1,500 pounds of spices that we discovered after we did a quick test that it was the spices that you read about in Exodus 30. And we did a couple scientific tests, paleobotanists, and it comes out exactly the recipe of the spices. So it says beneath the spices, there's a purification for the ashes of the red heifer. So since 1988, I've been involved in those digs to uh, try to find the ancient, what they call the Kalal, because if you read about it in Numbers 19, they divided in three parts, one part to use the ashes, one part in a safe place in the camp, and one for future generations. And that's what we are expecting. And it's speculation until you find something. But at least we know this isn't speculation anymore, so we're pretty certain beneath that we might find the ancient ashes because historically they always mixed in the ancient old ones with the new heifer all the way through. So what I find interesting personally, just my own opinion, my own involvement, that last November we were working with three archaeologists to open up the cave beneath the spices and another cave that I'll talk about a little later, why this is important. Because of the Gaza situation, everything was stopped. So here, while I'm waiting to go back to help find the ancient ashes in Qumran area, 
against all odds, I find myself taking care of the potential new ones. So after 2,000 years to be involved in something that's sort of lining up, I just say, hmm, it's, Very inter interesting. it's interesting to watch. Okay, so the next question is, can I smell the spices? This comes from the time of Jeremiah, because I'm pretty sure he's the one who hit it. So some people can, can um, I don't have a good sniffer, so some people, usually women can usually smell it better than men. Karen? Um, it should smell like cinnamon, but I, I do have a little, a little whiff. Yeah, some people yeah. can. Okay. Do you have yeah. a good nose? Yeah, but it's so old. But uh, when Amazing. the when the paleobotanist added the acid to see the uh, the ingredients, it released the aroma so strong oh. that he said his shop vent pulled the aroma out, and a tree next to the shop for about a month later. When he would come out there, he could smell the aroma come down off of the trees. Wow. And uh, they say when they were burning it, like in Jerusalem, the women wear, wouldn't wear perfume because, you know. So anyhow, um, really that's neat. the story here that led to the idea of finding the ancient ashes. And here, friends of mine, against all odd, said, do you want to see the new ones? I said, you know where they're at? I said, yeah. So it came up here. <laughs> well, growing up on a dairy farm and being a dairy farmer, when I saw the heifers, they were caked on the side there with some, they looked pretty bad. I, yeah, I won't use the description. So in November, uh, last February, two friends of mine, Chuck and Tammy, I always like to tell their name because they purchased all this hay here for them. And uh, they've really been helpful in what we needed to do. So anyhow, uh, we came up here and we looked at the mess that was here and, you know, People here weren't used to taking care of animals like us farm kids were. So we asked if we could, you know, clean out the pen. They said we could. You know, you aren't supposed to touch the heifers, so we made sure we didn't. So then it came back in the middle of April, and I found this bedding back there that's really good shavings. And I cleaned it out, put the shavings in, and it's amazing. They're cleaning themselves up. I mean, you mm. can hardly see. There's one cow that still has, you know, some of the manure mm. caked on the side, but that's what I wanted because they were such bad shape that I felt if they're so special, they should at least be presentable. That's good. So now they're presentable. So that's what I'm doing here. The age of these heifers right now? My understanding is they'd be old enough for the process, but wow. whenever that happens, when it happens, where it happens, that's, I'll leave that up to the other <laughs> people involved. So every once in a while, a rabbi comes out and checks, you know, color hair and everything. So. Wow. Well, and the main thing I tried to do is make pets out of them so that when they have to go through and check them, they're not scared or they just walk through. And so good. pretty well got them trained that uh, they, they come through there okay and <laughs> everything. So, yeah. And right now, just so you know, we had this hay that was bought, but it had rocks in it, weeds in it. And we actually had to call out a veterinarian one time because the weeds were so sharp, it got into one of the cow's teeth and caused problems. So uh, we got rid of the old stuff, and Chuck and Tammy bought that new alfalfa stuff mm. back there. So just this is about the third day now they're getting the good feed. So amazing! That is just a good feeling that I don't have to worry about their health <laughs> with the feed. So what a great story! So. Now let's go back to the Copper Scroll. Do you know Jim Barfield? Yes. And yep. what do you feel about his theory? The best way I can say he has the X, but not the Y. Okay. That's so there's it's a big mystery. It's a verbal treasure map yeah. uh, that was found in 1950 with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. I think in the last day of the dig of the French excavation. Yeah. It's now in Jordan in Amman. Correct, yeah. And I've seen it. Oh, okay. But it's spectacular what could be uh, buried. Yes. You know, I appreciate when people are looking for certain things, but like I say, practically speaking, most people, like I say, because the Copper Scroll starts out in the desolations of the Valley of Acor, uh -huh. that puts you a certain place. Right. Between Jericho and Sakaka, that gives you your, what I call your X. Right. By the Wadi Hakipa, that's your Y. Okay. And then it describes the Mahalot, you know, climbing up the cave of the column. And in 89, a friend of ours that was reading the Copper Scroll said there should be a cave opening at a certain place, according to the Copper Scroll. And we looked all over the place, we couldn't find anything. So four of us were on top of this hill. Three of us had given up and the fourth guy said, hey guys, I fell into a hole. <laughs> so we went up and looked 
and we looked in the front and you could not see mm. that there was anything there. But we started digging from the top of the hole, the top of the hill, and it came out the front. And here it ended up to be like an 18 foot cave opening. So we started cleaning that out in 92. And then at the bottom of the cave, we come across this wow. stuff. It looked like coffee grounds in the bedrock. And thought so that can't be too important because it didn't have any smell. And we were tossing this stuff off the side of the hill. Well, in archaeological dig, if you do find something different, you usually put it in a plastic bag, mark your quadrants, and mm -hmm. afterwards you look at it. Well, somebody happened to put that plastic bag with this material out in the rock in the hot sun, and the hot sun released the aroma. And one of the volunteers opened it up and says, this smells like cinnamon. Wow. And the archaeologist says, hold everything. So they quickly sent in a sample to get it tested, and Rick called back and says, those are the spices, the katorid of the temple. So then we started saving it, and I measured it all, and it was 1,500 pounds. So the reason I point that out is that quite often you hear people say, well, the Copper Scroll is just a hoax or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, way back then, you didn't go down to a hardware store and get a roll of copper. It had to be processed. It had to be... So it's not a hoax. It, it's a <laughs> it's a big deal because of how hard that would be to make that scroll. Yes. Yeah. So the main point was, unless one object is found in the copper scroll, then it makes the rest of it realize that it's 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 for right. I would say plausible for sure. Yeah. So that's where fascinating this comes in. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea this interview would take this turn, but that's another adventure. That's sure. what we do here at In Grace. Uh, we've talked to. Jim Barfield and Shelley Nice, who wrote the book yes. uh, for Jim, and we yeah. went to Qumran, and so um, this is this is fascinating. These these animals are fascinating. Yes, all uh, pretty much anything here in Israel is because you have the past, the present, and the future. Yes. Now, if I could add something, when people read Genesis 49, when Jacob was giving the blessings to his sons, even though this is the area of Ephraim, he was saying to Judah, which. Israel sort of takes the name, but you know, the Jewish people comes more like from Judah. Mm -hmm. Since you're here, if you ever read that blessing to Judah, you'll read it different after mm -hmm. I explain something here. Okay. In that blessing, for some reason, he mentions Shiloh. Well, of course, there's different opinions. Some say, well, that means the Mashiach would be called Shiloh. Some people say well, that means time of peace and everything. They say, I'm a practical farm kid. If it says Shiloh, I'm standing here in Shiloh. And here's some red heifers after these thousands of years. But what caught my attention every time I'm here, okay, you're from the United States. Two days, three days ago, there was a group here from Papua New Guinea. Other days, there's a group from Hawaii, from Europe, from South Africa, all over the world. If you read that verse, you will see that somehow or another, the nations become involved in Shiloh. And the thing that I practically always look at, practical ideas, for so many years, even you know, in the Christian world and the Jewish world, the idea of red heifers were sort of a, in, in your mind or you know, thinking about it. But I personally have seen here in Shiloh, the nations come here, look at something that isn't an idea anymore. <laughs> it's a reality. Then all of a sudden, you have to start rethinking things. What, what's going on here? So. That's where I really feel there's something happening here in reality that has for a long time just been an idea. The same way you should see the Jewish friends every morning, those who repeat their prayers, they repeat the recipe of the incense. Mm. I'm going to hand this to my Jewish friends and say that's the incense recipe that you've been repeating for thousands of years. And it's, wow. Mm. <laughs> you know, there's certain things that have been thought about, but when you see people here from all the nations seeing actual red heifers at Shiloh. Then when you read Genesis 49, you can read it a little bit different Interesting. than I did two weeks ago, put it that way. So, yeah. And where were you a uh, dairy farmer? Uh, Northern Indiana. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. It's been a, it's been a joy to hear your stories and to, to smell the ancient uh, incense. Yes. I wasn't expecting all of that. I was expecting to come and see the red heifers and see how they're doing. But to be able to meet Larry, the volunteer farmer from Indiana, and to hear his story, to hear what all he's doing to help these red heifers, and then to hear about the other things that he's involved with looking for the copper scroll treasure and possibly finding the incense for the temple. You know, I'm not sure about all that, but I do know that 
there is a future temple that's going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, right here. It's going to be a place that uh, I think is going to be built for the right reasons. People are trying to please God and, and, and they want to offer the sacrifices and they know without the sacrifices they, they can't please God. And so there's this dilemma. But we're all sinners and no matter how many sacrifices we offer, we can never save ourselves. We can never be perfect because we have sinned. You say, well, then what's the sacrificial system for? Well, I believe it was for two reasons. One, to show the severity of sin, to show how, how horrible sin is, that it's gonna take the death of a substitute, the death of an innocent animal in a sense, uh, to uh, show us the severity of sin and show us what's gonna have to happen. A substitute's, innocent substitute's uh, blood will have to be shed, a person's blood. But I also know that it was a way to keep fellowship um, between individuals and God and keep fellowship between the nation of Israel and God. So it points though to a final ultimate sacrifice. The, the blood of animals, the blood of bulls and goats cannot save, cannot wash away sin. But the perfect blood of the perfect man can. Is there any such thing as a perfect man? Yes, there's one. He was born not of an earthly father. He didn't have the sin nature born of a virgin. He was born here in Israel, just as predicted. He fulfilled dozens of prophecies exactly as predicted, including timing. And then he offered himself as a willing sacrifice. These red heifers, likely maybe one of them, might pass the scrutiny and perhaps they will sacrifice this animal for its ashes to be able to purify the nation so that they can resume the worship of the temple. But Again, that cannot purify us spiritually. It cannot purify our hearts. It cannot, it cannot save us because it's, a, it's an animal. We need the perfect human sacrifice that can only come from God as it did again here in Israel 2,000 years ago. So what does Jesus say? Well, Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the greatest news you're gonna ever hear because we're sinners, we're born with sin, we sin. Our sin separates us from God. But praise the Lord, God in his love and his mercy gave his son the perfect ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And if you'll trust in him, that blood is applied to your penalty, to your list of infractions, to your indictment. And no longer can you read your sins because the blood of Jesus covers them. And then you are a, a person that has received eternal life. You've, you've been given an eternal pardon and you will spend eternity with God. You will, you will be born again, the Bible says. Jesus said that. And if you're born again, you can never be unborn. Now we serve him because we love him, not to be saved or stay saved, but because we're saved. It's by grace that we're saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So all of this, red heifers and the temple and, and prophecy and even the copper scroll treasures. It's interesting, it really is. But don't forget the most important thing, the main thing, and that is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Here in Jerusalem, he was put into the grave. In three days he rose again. If you'll trust in him as your savior, you will never perish but have everlasting life. If you've enjoyed this video, we have a lot of other great content on our YouTube channel. Go through our YouTube channel, it's called In Grace. While you're on our channel, go ahead and click subscribe. That way that you will make sure that you get our videos, hit the bell, and that way you'll be alerted to our new videos. And we'd love for you to comment. Maybe you have some comments about the Red Heifers or the Temple. Uh, put the comments in there. I'd like to hear what you have to say and I like how YouTube is interactive. We also have some other great videos on our website. We have videos, we have DVDs, we have digital downloads, we have books, we have resources. And so if you love Israel, if you, you love creation, if you love the God of creation, the God of Israel, then I encourage you to check out our resources at ingrace.tv. For those of you that support us, we appreciate that so much. Would you consider a gift to make sure we can bring you more great content that has truth, especially from here in Israel? And for those of you that give to us monthly, a special thanks to you. Uh, you are the reason that we're able to be here in Israel and bringing you this good content. I hope that you are blessed and I hope that God blesses you and your family.